Thank you, April. Good morning, Good Shepherd. Good it's great to see everyone here on this third Sunday of Advent, the, Ad the Sunday of Joy. At this time, if you would please, if you could stand to join me in our call to worship, that's printed in the bulletin. Good Shepherd, what child is this? Lay to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping. So bring him incense, gold, and myrrh. Come, peasant and king, to own him. The king of kings salvation brings. Let loving hearts him. As we gather in worship, let us ponder the mystery of the incarnation, the word made flesh. Let our hearts and voices join chorus of heaven in adoration of the one who brings salvation. And our first hymn today is, What Child Is This? This third week of Advent, we light the candle of joy. We affirm the words Nehemiah, the joy of the Lord is our strength, a joy that fills our hearts with purpose, a joy renewed forever in the birth of Jesus. Luke 2, 8 through 11. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord.
Let us pray. Lord of joy, fill our hearts with rejoicing as we reflect on the birth of Jesus, who brings true joy to the world. Let our spirits overflow with the joy of your salvation. Amen. Welcome to each person here in person, each person on the live stream. What a joy it is to have you with us today. It certainly warms my heart to be surrounded by so many friends and uh, worshipers of the Lord as we celebrate this third Sunday of Advent. And I do want to thank all of those who caroled to the homebound last Sunday afternoon. It was a, a small but mighty group. Uh, and I, you know, John, I thought we sounded pretty good, and yeah, not, not too bad. I'm glad. Well, <laughs> I was glad that uh, you were there to carry me. And <laughs> uh, Veterans Giving Tree, a huge thank you. What a, a generous response. And Ed uh, gave me the uh, total so far, and there actually might still be more coming in. But uh, right now it stands at $885 uh, worth of gift cards that came in to help uh, veterans in need. Thank you so much. And I, I know there's been many giving opportunities this Advent season, and uh, your generosity is wonderful and most welcome to those who have the need. And uh, thank you to Alice for the Christmas musical yesterday. That certainly put me in a Christmas spirit. Uh, what a joy that was. And uh, don't forget Christmas Eve services coming right up. Hard to believe, isn't it? Next Sunday. And we'll have our Advent 4 service at 1030 in the morning. And then we will have our Christmas Eve service at 5 o'clock. And that will be our candlelit service. And we also will take up a collection uh, for the East Ridge Food Pantry, our white gift offering. So if you could bring some non-perishable food, wrap it in white tissue paper, if you don't have white tissue paper, grab any tissue paper. <laughs> if you don't have that, grab newspaper, whatever. It's more important that they, they get the food. And we always have a huge response, and we really fill that um, collection bin out there. So bring the food, and any monetary offering will go toward the deacons and their ministry throughout the year. Um, and also, January 7th, don't forget, we have a presentation on legacy planning. 
And there is a sign-up sheet at the back of the sanctuary if that would be something that interests you and a, uh, a lunch will be provided and then we will get to hear a presentation by uh, Jason Overmeyer of Thrivent. Are there other announcements here for the good of the body as we get rolling today? All right, I don't see any. So with that, let us bring the children forward for a children's <laughs> message led by Gary Heisel. Oregon shirt today. Mm -hmm. wow. Did they make the playoffs this year? To be honest, I have no idea. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did have a joke, uh, Gary. I couldn't imagine. Okay. Well, this is a little <laughs> bit of a Christmas joke. Why do crabs never get anybody any presents? You know why crabs never get anybody any presents? Because they like to pinch. That's it. They're penny pinchers. <laughs> <laughs> That was great. Wow. Well, good morning, children of God. Does anyone happen to know what we're celebrating one week from tomorrow? Anybody? Maybe Christmas? Yeah. Yeah, I think we all, we're all excited about Christmas, right? Christmas Day. You're probably looking forward to getting some presents. Maybe even looking forward to being with family as long as they don't take you away from your presence for too long. I can remember those days. I can actually remember looking out the window when I was a child looking for Santa Claus, believe it or not. That was like long, long, long time ago. So, Christmas is a very special time of the year for most people, and it's especially a good time of the year, fantastic time of the year for us Christians. The real reason we celebrate Christmas is often lost, though. At least the name of this holiday, though, makes it almost impossible for people to totally ignore what it is. If, you're, if your friends can't remember why we celebrate Christmas, you can just remind them that the first letters spell Christ, which happens to be the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. So we, we have the reason. And Lori's going to read some scripture later about that. And that lesson repeats the story that we love to hear about Jesus being born in Bethlehem, where the shepherds and the Magi found him lying in the manger with his mother, Mary, and his earthly father, Joseph, by his side. The Holy Family and, and everyone else living at that time had leaders with some evil ways. People were sinful then, and unfortunately they still are, we all are. There were definitely some bad people the time Jesus was born. The Magi who visited Jesus had asked King Herod where to find the baby. And they, when they asked him, or when Herod asked them, uh, they said, well, the baby was born king of the Jews. And Herod was a king who had a lot of power in his country and he wanted to be certain he maintained that position, so he wanted to have the, the baby killed. He was not paying any attention to what God had planned for the world, but God certainly knew the evil plans Herod had for his son, Jesus. We can be sure that God knows what's best for us. Herod had still not learned that God knows what is best, so God sent some angels to Joseph, and the angels told Joseph to take Mary and Joseph to Egypt to escape from Herod. Joseph had learned that what God told him was going to happen, so he did not waste any time in telling Mary the message he'd gotten, and after they heard that message, they whisked Jesus away to hide in safety. Mary, Joseph, and baby Jesus left their home at night, and they went to Egypt. Pastor Jeff gave a sermon about that on the Sunday before Thanksgiving, or no, right after Thanksgiving. And just by coincidence, or maybe some of God's plans, Karen and I were leaving for Egypt 
the same day that he gave that sermon. So we were fortunate enough to visit the church, or the building in Cairo, which is now a church, where they went to find safety. It happens to now be under two other churches because everything is so ancient there. God knew and planned how Jesus would live and grow. He knew that long before it happened. After Jesus grew up and wicked King Herod was dead, Mary, Joseph, and Jesus returned to Israel from Egypt. They came back to Israel to the district of Galilee where they lived in Nazareth. So instead of making this a story about how everything in the world is better at Christmas, I'm reminding us all that we live in a world that is impacted by sin, just like it was at the time of Herod. We all do bad things, and there is evil around us. This has always been the case. However, Jesus was born, and because of that, we have hope. We know that God is in control and loves us, and he's going to be here to take care of us. Let's get ready to celebrate Christmas, which is a celebration of the birth of our Savior, who will always be with us. Please join me in prayer. Dear God, thank you for your purposes and plans. You're always present and at work for us, even when things seem bad or difficult. Help us to trust in you. We love you, God. Thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. And I've got some bookmarks from Egypt. You can all pick one. Gary, that was a beautiful prayer. And I, I heard you say that uh, you used to you know, get excited about Santa coming a long, long time ago. I, I think you meant a long, long, long time. I'm just, <laughs> just kidding. The problem is I'm catching up to you. <laughs> well, I do have some updates um, on some of the folks that have been in medical care. Uh, Stan gets to go home on Wednesday, I believe. Is that right, Sally? Yes, I'm sure he's very excited about that. And uh, Linda Bittney got to move over to South Lake Village for uh, her care. And uh, uh, Bill uh, Rainey is still over in the hospital at St. E's. And certainly uh, all the prayers that, uh, uh, that you can give him are much appreciated. Um, are there any other prayer updates as we... Okay. If you would join me this time in the responsive part of our prayer, and then uh, we will pause as I offer some prayers of the people. Heavenly Father, grant us a sense of your timing so that we submit gracefully and rejoice quietly in the turning of the seasons. Endings such as the end of a season, the end of a grudge, the end of a job, the end of a tradition, and when a loved one reaches the end of life. Beginning such as a new season, a new friendship, a new crop, a new song, a new tradition, and even the birth of a new baby. Would you pray with me? A gracious God, in lighting the candle of joy today, we pray that our church may be a source of joy in the world as we carry your message of salvation offered to all who are not bound by pride and accept your gracious offer of abundant and eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, for our world, Lord, in all of its complexities and challenges and grudges and anger, we pray for peace. For our community, may, may we be instruments of joy and compassion and forgiveness. Uh, Lord, help us to be the kind of people who consider it an honor to overlook a slight, that we are people who stand out through our deep abiding joy 
and our forgiveness. Help us to reach out to neighbors in need, to offer support to the lonely and the sick. Oh Lord, for those who are ill or grieving or in any kind of distress, may they feel the comfort of your presence. Oh Lord, we remember before you today those who are in need of your loving care and strength and healing. We think of George Iraqi and Men Cha, Lori Jones, Linda Bittany, Bill Rainey, Ron Hostetler, Ann Owens, Mike DeVries, Stan Doctor, and Lord, we lift up the family of Dwight and Beth Languis. In all of these circumstances, Lord, we ask that you work in them, bringing the kind of peace and solace that only you can bring. Lord, uh, through your Son, uh, bring, bring us joy that even when we find difficult times that we know we will get through them with you. Uh, Lord, we give thanks for all of the blessings of life, all of those joys and also the challenges that shape us. May our hearts be open to the unexpected ways that you work in our lives as we journey toward the celebration of the birth of the baby Jesus this next weekend. Fill us with the wonder of Mary, the eagerness of the shepherds, and the perseverance of the Magi. Joining voices with the heavenly host and Christians throughout the world, we offer these prayers through Jesus Christ, Heavenly Father. It is in his strong name we pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, grant us a sense of your timing so that we submit gracefully to your will. Amen. And let us join together and let us sing our response in the bleak midwinter, verses 1 and 4. As we prepare to read scripture, please join me in a prayer for illumination. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. For the Word of God written, for the Word of God proclaimed, for the Word of God made flesh, Alpha and Omega give you these. May the everlasting Word be written on our hearts this day. Amen. Today we're reading from Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 14. This is Luke's recollection, recollection of the birth of Jesus. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to his own town to register. 
So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him, and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on the earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. The Lord's word. Carols We Love, presented by the Good Shepherd Church Choir. <laughs> Christmas carols, our beloved joy for all who celebrate the birth of Jesus. They depict hope, adoration, wonder, and peace, as well as joy and everlasting love. The choir has picked a few favorite Christmas carols to perform this year and would like to share the earliest known versions along with the history and meaning behind the songs. The first, uh, first carol entitled, There's a Song in the Air, was originally a poem, which first appeared in The Brilliant in 1874, a collection of Sunday school songs. It was written by Joseph G. Holland and based on Luke II. The poem was then set to music 30 years later by Carl P. Harrington, in 1905 for the new Methodist hymnal. There is something captivating about this simple Christian hymn, and Christmas, a Christmas hymn, with its almost childlike wonder. The first stanza is a series of declarative statements that invite the singer to marvel at Christ's birth as if we were physically present at the event. Our attention is first drawn to the heavens. We hear this song, the song of the angels singing glory to God in the highest and peace on earth, Luke 2.14. We see the star, the one that guided the magi in Matthew 2. Then we focus our attention to the scene immediately around us. We see the mother in prayer and hear the cry of an infant. The final line of the opening stanza ties the heavenly and earthly scene together. And the paradox of this vision becomes apparent. Heavenly events are pointing to the most humble of settings in a small, out-of-the-way village, the birth of a king. Let us enjoy. There's a song in the air.
one of the best known hymns of the Christmas season. O Little Town of Bethlehem originated in 1868 as a poem written for the Sunday School of the Church of the Holy Trinity in Philadelphia's Rittenhouse Square. The words by Rector Phillips Brooks, inspired by his recent trip to the Holy Land, resonated with the people, with themes of stillness and peace in the aftermath of the Civil War. The now famous tune was written by Louis H. Redner, a wealthy real estate broker who served as a church organist for his hobby. It was noticed that Redner increased Sunday school attendance at Holy Trinity Episcopal, where Phillips Brooks was rector from 36 to over 1,000 during his 19 years as superintendent. Redner noted that the simple music was written in great haste and under great pressure almost on the eve of Christmas. It was after midnight that a little angel whispered the strain in my ears, and I roused myself and jotted it down as you have it. The original tune seems not universally loved, however. In Great Britain, Ralph Vaughan Williams, the famous composer, paired this text with the British folk tune Forest Green for the English hymnal in 1906. This was heralded as a great achievement as the American tune had been derided by British hymnologist Eric Routley as broken-backed and paralytic. Such is the difference in musical taste of two countries an ocean apart. Regardless of the feelings about the tune, hymnologists on both sides of the Atlantic agree on the poignancy of the text. Dr. Watson sums it up well. Not only does the hymn beautifully describe the little town asleep in the December night, it also gracefully modulates from a description of Christmas into an examination of the meaning of Christmas. First in its encouragement of charity and faith, and then into the coming of Christ into the human heart. Today we will sing both tunes. The original American tune called St. Louis and the British one named Forest Green.
silent night is about a calm and bright silent night and the wonder of a tender and mild newborn child. Words written in 1816 by a young priest in Austria, Joseph Moore. Not long after the Napoleonic Wars had taken their toll, the music was written by teacher and organist Franz Cassaver Gruber. At the time, Latin was the predominant language of the Catholic Church, although no one was able to understand the services in the German-speaking countries. Joseph Moore helped bring German to the services, which the people loved. The traditionalist priest did not, however, and many refused to use German in church outright. They even went so far as to spread horrible rumors about Joseph to turn the people against him. Even the organist Gruber, who wrote the music to Silent Night and was Joseph's close friend, was being swayed. However, just before Christmas in 1818, when Joseph's situation was most bleak, the church organ broke down. Officially, the mice were held to blame. Some say it was flooding, but it is likely that Gruber himself was responsible. Either way, it was impossible to hold the Christmas celebrations in the traditional way. The traditionalist priest was at his wit's end and had no choice but to accept Joseph and Franz Gruber's offer of an alternative mass using guitar under normal circumstances. It would never have been acceptable for a German song to be played with guitar accompaniment in church. It was Christmas Eve, 1818, when the now famous carol was first performed as Still Nacht Heilige Nacht, Joseph Moore, the young priest who wrote the lyrics, played the guitar and sang along with Franz Gruber, the choir director and organist who had written the melody. An organ builder and repairman working at the church took a copy of the sixth first song home to his village. There it was picked up and spread by two families of traveling folk singers who performed around Europe. In 1834, the Strasser family performed it for the King of Prussia. In 1839, the Rayner family of singers debuted the carol outside Trinity Church in New York City. The composition evolved. It was translated into over 300 languages with many different arrangements for various voices and ensembles. It was sung in churches, in town squares, and even on the battlefield during World War I, when, during a temporary truce on Christmas Eve, soldiers sang carols from home. Silent Night, by 1914, known around the world, was sung simultaneously in French, German, and English. We sing it in the original German today. Let us hear Silent Night.
in 1901, John Wesley Work Jr. set out on a daunting task to collect slave songs and spirituals that had been passed down orally from plantation to plantation in the South. As the son of a church choir director, John grew up in Nashville loving music. So he and his wife and brother set out, collected these songs, and for the first time wrote them down. Six years later, his books, which contained Go Tell It on the Mountain, were published and made famous by the Fisk Jubilee Singers of Fisk University. The original singers of the song fulfilled the same important task the angels gave the shepherds that first Christmas night outside of Bethlehem, proclaiming that Jesus Christ is born. And thanks to John Wesley Work Jr., so can we. Go tell it on the mountain. take this opportunity to thank the choir and thank John and April. What a beautiful presentation of the history of Christmas music. Thank you so much. <laughs> if, if Go Tell It on the Mountain doesn't put you in Christmas spirit, I don't know what is. I, I just love that song. And at this time, I would ask you to stand, and uh, we will receive the good words, the benediction, and also we'll get to sing that song ourselves as a finale today. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. Romans 15, 13. <laughs> 